so let's begin. One thing most of us can say about 2009 is, we are glad that one's behind us. But we at Treasury Strategies see some good things ahead, some interesting and possibly tricky challenges in our crystal ball for 2010. And these are gathered up in our theme of retooling for recovery. I'll mention a couple of the key challenges now and then hand them to my colleagues for a deeper dive. First of all, we foresee some possibly tricky interest rate waters to navigate. Central governments around the world are keeping short rates tethered to the ground, while the rest of the yield curve grows steeper by the week. We have to hope that when they let go of that tether, it's not really a rubber band that snaps back with a two or 300 basis point short rate jump. But it could be, and that steep yield curve is already a reality. So how to navigate this? Secondly, we see capacity challenges for Treasury. Historically, the firms who have been most successful after a recession are the ones fastest out of the gate. These are the companies that are going to be opening new markets, adding lines of business, active in M&A. So Treasury has to go heads up and create Treasury capacity to support that corporate growth. Treasury cannot afford to be the ones holding up progress. We need to think in terms of a Treasury that's scalable and extendable, something that will support these new lines of business, new types of risk, new payments, expanded geographies. And with unpredicted events popping up predictably these days, Treasury has new status as the go-to people for information and analysis. When financial news breaks, people in your firm are going to want to know, how are we affected? What are our up-to-the-minute exposures? What's your assessment? What are our options? Thirdly, we foresee a continued insatiable appetite for automation. This spin cycle that we're coming out of now has really underscored the need to have your ducks in a row, your liquidity ducks, your risk ducks, your counterparty ducks, basically everything someone might want to know about on a moment's notice. Combine that with the going forward requirement for Treasury to create additional capacity to support corporate growth, it puts a spotlight right on the value of a comprehensive and integrated Treasury technology. And if you don't have that already, you're really going to need it. You need a strategy and a roadmap for getting there. And all these things need to be done with a third eye on regulation, which is kind of the backdrop for everything. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mike Galanis. Mike is a Treasury Strategies partner. He's head of our corporate consulting practice. He's going to take us deeper into these prospects. Thank you, Kathy. In last year's message, we predicted large-scale economic, environmental, or geopolitical events would burden Treasury with tactical concerns. We also expected senior management demands would elevate Treasury's profile in the organization. We recommended Treasury focus on basic, practical steps to enable continued effective functioning under the most difficult conditions. We called this reinforcing the cornerstones of Treasury. There is general consensus now for a global recovery in 2010 and 2011. While some parts of the world will recover faster than others, the global nature of business today means companies must be prepared to respond wherever situations demand. Recovery will create added demands and new opportunities for Treasury. Accordingly, our theme for success in 2010 is retooling for recovery. We've been in economic crisis for the past 18 months and are thankfully moving out. Crisis conditions create dislocation in resource alignment due to an almost exclusive focus on crisis management and survival. As world economies recover, resources will adjust and realign. This will cause temporary financial dislocations and foster opportunity for corporate growth and expansion. These will in turn create new demands and opportunities for Treasury. Let's discuss a few that may be critically important. Beginning with interest rate issues, central governments continue to hold down short-term rates. In general, short rates are tethered at or near zero. 
but long rates are increasing. We're in fact facing a yield curve that looks much like a tsunami, a wall of water. This tempts yield-starved treasurers to take some principal risk and go long, while risking a very sharp spike in short-term rates, which could easily happen if markets overwhelm central banks and they lose their grip on the tether. This is not just about investment, though. Should you borrow what you expect your company will need for the next 6 to 12 months at 3% and then turn around and invest the excess at 20 basis points short-term? In today's rate environment, this happens more often than you might expect. With this sort of negative arbitrage, your company's bottom line numbers will quickly turn red. Now let's consider FX volatility. Increased concerns about sovereign risk impact the relative value of currencies. As central banks around the world develop different approaches and different paces for their crisis management exit strategies, this will further change the relative value of their currencies. Iceland's currency crashed, Dubai is rattling, and Greece's debt crisis is impacting the euro. A few days ago, China instituted major restrictions on bank lending, and just this morning, the media was discussing the looming debt crisis in Japan. Radical events are fueling FX volatility. This will not change. We will always see economic and political forces impacting the markets where we operate. In 2010, we are also likely to see added regulation. In fact, some people are already calling 2010 the year of regulation. Take the recently proposed 15 basis point tax in the U.S. on large bank uninsured liabilities. That was the proposal of the week two weeks ago. This reg would raise costs for all banks and for those who do business with banks. Other bank regulations will limit the power of financial services firms. Last week's proposal would force banks to choose between deposit taking and trading businesses. What if you had just completed a global banking RFP and concentrated your liquidity in a bank that decides to get out of the deposit business entirely? Across the globe, regulators are in an arms race to outregulate each other. They're using such tools as capital requirements, trading curves, compensating limits, and taxes. In the end, this will not only increase costs, but may change the way we do business and with whom, and perhaps even where we do business. On the corporate side, the proposed regulations dealing with over-the-counter trading of derivatives will add a new set of concerns for firms using swaps and forwards to manage the risks. While striving to add transparency and control, the regulation is also likely to bring with it added costs to all parties using these instruments. Finally, as the economy recovers, we expect to see a spike upward in the area of corporate expansion. As Kathy said earlier, companies that do best after a recession are those ready to run from the gate. Expect to see accelerated international expansion and increased M&A activity in 2010. Now, as these events come to fruition, Treasury's greatest risk will be not having sufficient capacity to support the growth that the company is looking to achieve. In fact, let me repeat that. This is really important. Treasury's greatest risk will be not having sufficient capacity to support the growth that the company is looking to achieve. To know if you are at risk, ask yourself, could Treasury support a 20% growth in the business? What would happen if three months from now our organization entered new markets or acquired a significant new business? Some forward-thinking Treasury departments are already planning for these types of events. Let me give you two examples from among our client base. We are currently working with the treasurers of two large corporations to help them put in place banking and treasury processes to support future growth in new markets, specifically growth in China, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. One of these companies is working to develop new banking structures to improve cash visibility and enhance liquidity management in these regions. We're working with the second company to develop templates for global treasury operations. These will enable its treasury to move seamlessly into new geographic regions and very rapidly attain full operating capacity by understanding all banking, risk, liquidity, and regulatory practices within each of these regions. These treasurers could have sat back and waited for growth to occur, but they see the value in taking proactive steps to prepare. 
to stay a few steps ahead in management of their business. As seen from these two examples, Treasury is well positioned to play a critical role in supporting the company's growth, if it chooses. So as you start 2010, it's key that you architect Treasury with an eye on extending capacity, scalability, and reach. The areas most vital in achieving this are staffing, business processes, and technology. Our recommended retooling strategy will address each of these areas in detail. With that backdrop, Elizabeth St. Ange, who's a managing director of our firm and head of our technology practice, will now share with you the specifics of our retooling strategy. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. As Mike mentioned, there are three areas to focus on to prepare for rapid growth and expansion staffing, processes, and technology. We'll now spend a few moments delving into a greater discussion on each of these areas. First, let's take a look at staffing. Over the past couple of years, with the difficult financial conditions and the uncertainty that existed in the market, many companies clamped down on hiring, staff training, as well as conference attendance. As the recovery now gets underway, staffing is crucial. The reason it is crucial is you need to ensure you have the right amount of staff, focus in the right areas, and possessing the, possessing the right skills and knowledge to do the job well. You really don't want a lack of staff or skills to prevent you from playing that strategic and value-added role as your company recovers. To ensure this, you may want to look at creating a staffing plan and a strategy touching these five components, roles and responsibilities, staffing levels, recruiting, training, and business continuity. Let's take a look at roles and responsibilities. Here you need to clearly define the role of each team member so that they can understand what is expected of them. You might also want to think about whether you need to redefine roles and responsibilities as you work on thinking about the future and the new tasks and opportunities that may come your way. In terms of staffing level, you need to identify the right staff levels to meet both short as well as long-term needs. As Mike says, what happens if in three months from now business is up significantly or you have a new acquisition? Your strategy here may, may also include how you plan to supplement your staff if you have immediate and urgent needs. For instance, it could mean uh, temporarily hiring an external firm or bringing in resources from other teams. In terms of uh, the recruiting strategy, you want to think about how you will recruit staff, what channels you will use to find good candidates, as well as what types of skills and experience you want to supplement your team with. Training involves developing guidelines and requirements in terms of cross-training and continuing education. One of the things we hear from many of our clients is that Treasury is being asked to play a new role in the organization. That um, Treasury is providing more advice and guidance and becoming an, ex an internal consultant to the business units and to the other groups within the organization. Because of this, you may wish to consider training beyond traditional Treasury management. For instance, training in terms of tax, working capital management, pension, and real estate. The final component here is business continuity. Because Treasury tends to be a small department, and relies on, on spreadsheets, which are very proprietary tools, often we see the knowledge required to perform a task reside in the, in the mind of one person. So in order to ensure business continuity, you want to have clear documentation, discipline cross-training, and also job rotation. So to recap, while staffing may have been set aside as you focus on crisis management over the last couple of years, it's now time to bring it back to the forefront. The next piece in our uh, retooling strategy is business processes. Mike mentioned earlier that as the economic recovery speeds up, interest and inflation rates are likely to climb, and FX rates will be volatile. Under these conditions, you'll need real-time, flexible, and effective processes to manage your cash, investments, debt, and FX. The reason this is important is because business processes will create the framework within which you will function. 
meaning both current needs that you're aware of as well as anything new that may come your way unexpectedly. Your focus on business processes means that you want to look at standardizing, centralizing, and automating as much as you can while also ensuring flexibility and a nimble approach to problem solving. To determine if you have a disciplined yet flexible approach, take a step back and evaluate the key elements of your business process framework. During this assessment, you want to take a look at whether your processes enable you to meet these three critical objectives that you can provide effective global cash and liquidity management, that you can identify, measure, and mitigate global financial and operational risk, and that you can support regulatory compliance and the needs for senior management reporting. Structuring effective business processes involves many steps and should start with a detailed review and documentation of your processes. Next, you want to identify those opportunities for improvements in terms of standardization, centralization, and automation. And be careful here of the habitual trap. That is that things are being done a certain way, not because it's the best way of doing it, but because it's always been done that way and it's become a habit. A gap analysis between your processes and industry best practices will enable you to develop further ideas for improvement. Finally, you'll develop a list of improvements and identify sequencing, timing, and the resources needed to make the changes. So, so far we've looked at the first two components of our retooling strategy, staffing and business processes. The third component is effective technology. This is the final element and it's essential in providing you with the capacity you need to enable your company's growth and recovery. The reason technology is important is because it's the foundation you will need to build this new house that you're creating for Treasury. The demands on Treasury today are just too high to be able to function successfully using ineffective technology. Spreadsheets and disparate systems may have served you well in the past, but as you think about the new demands and opportunities that will come your way over the next year, you'll really need that very strong foundation. As we mentioned earlier, the recent financial crisis has raised the profile of Treasury within the organization and highlighted the need for real-time cash visibility, risk management, and decision support. Enhanced technology will play a pivotal role in enabling you to take on the new roles and responsibilities. The good news, though, is that senior management position on Treasury technology has fundamentally changed. Historically, when we worked with organizations who were looking at technology, Treasury had to build a very, very strong quantitative business case because technology was viewed as a cost expenditure. Also, technology was used to replace spreadsheets, which as a tool to manage spreadsheet is not optimal, but it wasn't really broken. So many organizations took the attitude of, if it's not broken, don't fix it and it could be very difficult to justify the need for a better technology architecture. We also saw some companies that managed to justify a treasury technology purchase only do partial implementations or not upgrade and optimize the system over the years. This was because treasury technology was not viewed as a strategic solution and so was put at the bottom of the, the priority list. So what we see in many companies today is either a complete lack of technology beyond spreadsheets or suboptimal use of systems. But as I said earlier, this is changing. This is a great time to, to look at treasury technology and invest in it because many organizations today view treasury technology as an investment in risk management, similar to an insurance policy. Treasury technology will enable you to have optimal liquidity management, centralized decision-making and control, as well as the reports, dashboards, and metrics that you need. I've been talking so far about the fact that Treasury technology is, is an exciting time right now, that there are a lot of opportunities to invest in it because senior management has taken a view of it in terms of a strategic solution and an investment rather than a cost. The other reason now is a perfect time is because the types of systems, vendors, and functionality available has never been greater. 
There's a plethora of solutions available, different deployment types, different solutions, and a lot of functionality that has been improved over the last year or two. The components of an effective technology architecture are a centralized database and system for all of your treasury function, from cash to risk management, FX, debt, investments, and intercompany lending. Automated information gathering via interfaces or web entry. Standardized bank connectivity, which has become much easier with SWIFT corporate connectivity. Automated trading and electronic transaction confirmation. Workflow management and detailed forecasting and reporting. Never before has so much functionality and capabilities been available to meet the needs of Treasury. So we encourage you to really look hard at your technology architecture and ask yourself if it's truly enabling increased growth, capacity, and flexibility. Is it the foundation you need to grow your Treasury function? If not, how could it be improved? So we've looked at the three components of your retooling strategy, staffing, business processes, and technology. I'll now hand it back over to Kathy, who will recap our session. Great, Elizabeth, and thank you, Mike, also. Let me quickly summarize. We're anticipating having some very interesting interest rate and FX situations to navigate this year. As we move out of crisis mode and back into normal mode, you're basically going to have to pick your way through the rubble until you find some level ground. We also see Treasury continuing to be turned to as the impact assessor inside the company. You're going to need the skills of a financial analyst, really good information sources, and up-to-the-minute knowledge of your exposures, your positions, and your partners. And the regulatory backdrop is far from painted. It's going to require you to sort out on a regular basis what does and doesn't apply to you, what your options are, and what you recommend. You're going to need strong additional treasury capacity, strong processes, and a well-thought-out technology architecture to manage your way through this. Okay, let's expand this now beyond the corporate perspective and incorporate a few words for the banks. And to do that, I'm going to turn to Dave Robertson, also a partner of Treasury Strategies and head of our financial services practice. Dave, what should financial providers do to help their clients retool for recovery? Well, Kathy, let me echo you by saying I'm happy that we're talking about recovery. We're seeing our financial services clients gear up for reinvestment across their business. And there's obviously a lot of options as to where that capital and increased spend can go to. What we see is that the success factors for financial service providers are flexibility, speed, and advice. By being flexible, fast, and advisory, providers can not only ramp up their own business, but they can be best prepared to help out their customers during the recovery. And I want you to picture your client and think about your client that is spinning off a business or a client that's entering a new market or even buying a business. Now, as we know, these events don't unfold slowly. They happen very quickly, and the ability to respond on the dime is going to be critical. Imagine your client is under pressure and they're thinking to themselves, I've got to overlay this whole new treasury and banking structure. What bank is going to make this easy for me to set up my services and to get those services integrated into an overall treasury architecture? And then ask yourself, is that bank your bank? I think it's interesting to reflect that all too often, banks are difficult to do business with. We're the one industry that actually makes it hard for customers to buy our services. And let's face it, the regulators aren't making that any easier. As you look ahead in 2010, and really think about your capacity to meet your clients, ask yourself, can you streamline your processes to add new accounts and services? Could you almost provide a concierge service to make it really easy for your clients to port accounts and payments into your banking solutions? And how rapidly and how deeply can you devoid, deploy advice as to the best way to integrate new markets or business units into your clients' banking structures? The banks that can do that best are going to be the banks that become the primary bank and gather the most liquidity and payments from their customers. We think it's important to think about the recovery from your client's perspective. Mike outlined a lot of macroeconomic changes that could really stress many of, of your corporate clients. Think of, as to how a rapid change in interest rates or currency values could affect your clients. We talked about the tsunami of high forward rates rolling into the short end of a curve. Are your clients prepared for that? 
Elizabeth talked about the need for cash visibility. Do your clients have the information that they need to forecast and hedge cash and FX exposures? Do they have the right account structure to segregate that information and make sense of it? More than ever, Treasury Strategies sees the needs for banks to connect the cash management and capital markets advice. Your clients don't need one set of liquidity advice and another set of advice around FX and interest rate exposures. They need a holistic view of the risk exposure and an understanding of how your cash management and capital markets products can help them identify, measure, and manage those exposures. Thank so you, Dave. Let, let's turn to Moni Lindsay, who is a managing director at Treasury Strategies and head of our London office. Another question about banking, Moni. With the recovery, do we expect corporate globalization to accelerate, and how can banks best support their customers in that? Thanks, Kathy. Well, I think it's clear from what everybody's been saying today and what we're seeing in the market that, yes, corporates are going to be expanding and globalizing, um, and very rapidly as the recovery um, takes off. For banks, they really need to be doing two things that they've always done. And one is understand your customer's need, and two is be very clear and defined about what your value proposition is and helping them meet those needs. So looking first at, at the customer needs, we've helped a number of our clients segment their customer base uh, along the globalization continuum. So looking at customers that are purely d domestic all the way up to the largest multinationals. Their banking needs change dramatically along that line. For example, if a company is taking a, its first foray outside the, the boundaries of its, of its home country, it needs a lot of hand-holding and a lot of advisory. It probably needs trade finance services. It needs help setting up an account in China, an account in India, an account in Europe. So again, a lot of hand-holding. But again, once you get up to the largest multinationals, they already have very sophisticated solutions in place, and they're looking for banks to really help support those solutions. And even more in this environment, as everybody's pointed out, there's a lot on their plates. They're looking for their banks to be advisory. Um, they're looking for the banks to be very clear on what they're offering. Are they offering a pan-regional solution? Are they offering uh, regional solutions in multiple regions? Or are they a true global provider? So, again, from the bank's perspective, you need to promote and provide real clarity both internally with your sales and externally with your customers around what your value proposition is. So when we look at what the most successful banks will, uh, will be in winning customers' business as they globalize, one, they will have segmented their customer base. Um, they will fully understand the needs of the various segments. They will have identified and addressed any solution gaps in their value proposition required to meet those needs. And they'll prov provide internal and external clarity around the value proposition. Moni and Dave, thank you for these additional points of view. We're going to leave the session open for about another five minutes so you can finish submitting your questions online. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be answering those with you individually after the webinar. Our goal today was to share some of our insights for 2010 and how you can deal with these challenges more profitably. We gave you a few starter points. We only have a half hour. We can't cover everything, but we did get to talk about capacity, better processes, strategic technology, and support for globalization. The benefits for you are to be better situated and better able to take advantage of the positive opportunities that 2010 is bringing. Now to gain these benefits, you need to go back to your office and think about how do I apply this? What challenges will we have in applying this? And wherever you need a piece of advice, that's what we're here for. So contact us, give us a call. Thank you so much for listening today. Have a great 2010.